Hi, it's Gary and welcome back to the workshop. Measuring and adjusting action on guitars is one of the most fundamental things we can do in Luthery. And in today's video, I've got three chapters for you. The first chapter, I'll show you how to make a simple and effective action gauge, followed by a chapter on how to use the gauge to measure your action. And in the third chapter, I'll show you how you can use the numbers that you get with the gauge to adjust your action by changing the heights of your saddle. So feel free to jump ahead to the different chapters that you want to see. And so let's get into it now. Let me start by saying that there are several commercially available action gauges that you can buy, such as this digital one from Luthier's Mercantile. It's really great, but it's $50. And there's less expensive ones, such as this one from Stuart McDonald, but I find it really hard to read and just not a very good option. The one that I like that you can make in your own workshop with scrap wood is just a simple wedge that you calibrate on your own. And I'll show you how you can make it now. The way that it works is you slide the gauge between the top of the 12th fret and the string of choice. The action height is the width of the wedge when it touches both. Here's a schematic of the gauge which starts as a piece of wood with these dimensions. And what we're going to do is sand in a wedge shape to these dimensions. Then what we'll do is we'll take a digital caliper and then mark in gradation marks ranging from 2.0 to 5.0 millimeters, which is very reasonable for the action heights of a classical guitar. And finally, I want to point out that you want to orient the grain so that it is perpendicular to the face so that the width of the wedge doesn't change much with respect to humidity. Here I start with a piece of East Indian rosewood that's 28 millimeters wide and thickness it to 6 millimeters. I have it long enough to make two gauges. And as you'll see, this makes it easier to hold and you'll make one of your guitarist or luthier friends really happy with this gift. To sand the wedge, I mark witness lines to show where I've removed material on the belt sander and check thicknesses with a caliper. It helps to use a block of wood to press down and keep everything even and flat. When the wedge is complete, I mark another set of witness lines on the side that will eventually face the strings and taper in a direction that's 90 degrees to the first taper so that if I'm holding the thick end of the wedge, the left side of the gauge will be about one millimeter thinner than on the right side. You'll see in a minute that this helps make it exactly clear what thickness your string hits the gauge. Then you can cut your pieces. It helps to paint the upper faces of the gauges so we'll be able to mark and see the calibration lines easily. Okay, I have my wedges prepared and I have the faces ready to calibrate and mark. And the two things that I'll need are a digital caliper and it helps to have a locking feature that can lock the jaws in place when we take a measurement. And then a fine tip marking pen like a Sharpie, but it just really has to be very fine because we're going to be making very small gradations on the face of the wedge. And you'll notice that when we have the completed wedge and we're going to take measurements for action, we're going to slip it so that the, the uh, thin end goes in first and it and the wedge rides on top of the 11th and 12th frets so that the incoming string will hit the right edge of the wedge. And so we will be measuring and marking the right edge of this gauge. So let me show you how to do that now. The first thing we're going to do with our caliper is to make sure that it's zeroed and I'm going to zero it throughout this whole process to make sure that everything is accurate. And I'm going to use millimeters because that's a convention that I'm used to using. And it also spreads out the gradations very nicely along this size wedge. So what I need to do first is to measure the thinnest part 
of the wedge on the right side. So I'll use my finger as a backstop and just measure. And it's 1.81 millimeters thick. And if you remember, we made the right side a little bit thicker than the left side. And that's so that the incoming string, when we take the measurement, it will hit the right edge first. And so this left side is about half a millimeter to one millimeter thinner than the right side in order to achieve that. All right, so since this is 1.81 millimeters on, over at the thinnest part, I'm going to start my gradations at 2.0 millimeters. So I'm going to dial up 2.0 And this caliper goes to hundredths, and so 2.00 or 2.01 is close enough, and I'm going to lock it in at 2.01. And then I'm going to slip the jaws into the thin side of the wedge, and I'm going to slide it until it stops in that thickness on the wedge will be 2.0 millimeters. And where it stops, it should be fairly snug. And then I'm going to take the jaws of the caliper and I'm kind of going to dig into the paint and try to make a mark in the face of the wedge that I can see. And now if you can see a mark in the paint, but now where that mark in the paint is, I'm going to take my marker pen and I'm going to draw in the mark. Like that. And then I'm going to mark it as 2.0. And now you get the idea of how we're going to proceed. The next gradation that I'm going to dial up after unlocking the caliper is 2.10, 2.1 millimeters. And then I'm going to come in again and where it stops, I'm going to dig in again. And mark it. and label and so forth. So you can keep going alongside this right edge all the way up until you get to the end of the wedge. I'm going to go up to 5.0 because that's really, these are the extreme limits on a classical guitar. And I found that this range from two to five millimeters really works out well. So I'm going to go ahead and mark up and finish this wedge. Here's the finished gauge with the markings made on the face. And you'll notice that the, the calibrations aren't completely uniformly spread across the face. And that's okay because it's nearly impossible to make the angle of the wedge completely uniform across the edge. But that's okay because the markings are based on actual measurements with the caliper. So next I want to show you how to use it on a guitar and then take you through a couple real world examples of how you would use these measurements to change the action on your guitar if you needed it. Now let's use the gauge to measure the action on this guitar. And what we want to do is slide the wedge between the fret and the strings so that the wedge rides on top of the 11th and 12th frets. And if your fingerboard has a radius to it, you want to make sure that the bottom of the wedge makes contact with the, the 12th fret uh, right below the string that you're measuring. So let's go ahead and measure the sixth string. And I'm going to insert the wedge until the top of the wedge hits the bottom of the string of interest. And so the way that you'll know is if you start to tap the string, when it makes 
this sound, you know there's a gap between the wedge and the string. So you just keep moving until the sound just disappears. So I am at 3.4 millimeters, 3.3, 3.6, and now the sound is just about disappearing in there. It's just disappeared at 3.7 millimeters. So that's the action distance on the six string, 3.7 millimeters. Now, let's use this digital caliper and see how it compares to our wedge. So the way this works is it has a plunger that before I depress the plunger, I'm going to zero it. That plunger is sitting on top of the six string right now. So I'll zero it. And then when I depress the plunger, it will force the string against the fret. And that reading is 3.73 millimeters. That's the distance that the string traveled to meet the fret. And so that's another action reading. And so 3.73 compared to 3.7 on the wedge. So this should give you confidence that this method using the wedge works really well. Now let's measure another string. Now ideally you want to measure the action on every string, but just to show you how to do it on let's say the treble string, let's try the first string now. So I'll insert, now you have a different kind of sound as I bang it. It's more of a plink, a quieter plink compared to the bass string, but I can still hear it. So I'm at 2.9 millimeters now, 3.0, it's still plinking, 3.2, and it's getting softer. So it's about, it disappeared at 3.3 millimeters. So that's our action on the first string. Now, let me describe to you how I might use this information to change the action on this guitar if I needed to. Let's take an example of the sixth string where in the previous chapter we measured the action with our gauge to be 3.7 millimeters and we want to lower it to 3.5. That doesn't seem like much of a difference but our left hands are very sensitive and we can easily feel a difference of 0.2 millimeters. To optimize the sixth string action only, we know that we must file and sand material off the top of the saddle at that location, but how much? Looking at the geometry of a guitar, we can see that since the 12th fret, which is where we by definition measure action, it's half the distance to the saddle, so any difference at the 12th must be doubled at the saddle. And here's the calculation. Now let me show you how to proceed with the saddle reduction in a very practical and exacting way. Before removing the saddle, the first step is to mark the positions of the strings with a pencil. After you remove the saddle, transpose those marks to the side so you can always see where to measure and remove material. Measure the height of the saddle, making sure the caliper is squarely seated on the bottom of the saddle. Now going back to our notes, the beginning saddle height we just measured was 6.44 millimeters, and we know that we must remove 0.40 millimeters from that saddle height, making the new target saddle height 6.04 millimeters. 6.04, that's the magic number we need to sneak up to. Now you can start to file and sand away at the location judiciously with the correct ramp shape and frequently measuring with the caliper as you go. Note that you must hit your target height after all the sanding and buffing is done and also taking into account any faceting type of compensation that you've done at the front edge of the saddle in order to achieve correct intonation. This all sounds complicated, but it's really not with a small amount of care and I promise you that you will have excellent control and consistency over your action settings.
Now let's go in the other direction and consider an example where we want to raise the action of the sixth string from the 3.7 millimeters we measured and bring it to 4.0. Obviously we need to add some material, either making an entirely new saddle or adding a shim under the original saddle. Compared to lowering action, raising action is generally more complex and requires considering the pros and cons before choosing your route. Making a new saddle is the more laborious route, but more structurally and aesthetically satisfying. To do this, we have to calculate the new saddle height. We know that the difference in action will be 0.3 millimeters, and by applying the two times rule, the change in saddle height needs to be two times 0.3 millimeters, which is 0.6 millimeters, which we'll be adding to the height. So for the new saddle, recall from our last example, we measured the original saddle height under the sixth string to be 6.44 millimeters, and therefore the height of our new saddle needs to be 6.44 plus 0.6 equals 7.04 millimeters tall. If no other adjustments are needed for the other string's actions, then just replicate the old saddle heights. But if other strings need adjustments, no problem, you know how to figure their new saddle heights. There are some merits to shimming a saddle. In general, I and most players can't hear a difference with a shim, assuming that it's done well and the structure is solid. It can save you time, but there are a couple caveats. If you decide to shim, you'll need to get a hardwood veneer that's 0.6 millimeters thick. You could either make it or buy it and then cut it up into the shape of the saddle's footprint. Of course, the downside is that all the strings get raised by 0.3 millimeters of action. However, that might be what you want for the majority of the strings anyway. And for those that don't need raising, you could do the calculations and shave the saddle at those positions accordingly. Another sneaky solution might be to create a wedge-shaped veneer that's 0.6 millimeters under the sixth string and linearly tapered by scraping and sanding to nearly nothing under the first string. In this case, the increase is base biased, and often this can be a really good solution. Before I leave you, let me say that all of these options should be weighed in consultation with the player, explaining what they're going to experience in the right and left hands with each of these variations. And for me, the lesson I've learned from all of this work is that the ability to accurately measure with an action gauge and a caliper gives you great control and many options. Now you know the basics of how to measure and manipulate the action of your guitars, and it all starts with a very simple tool. So I hope you enjoy using your action gauge over the years, and I'll see you on the next video.